Yes, it is. Well, this is <laughs> going to be streamed to YouTube, but I'm probably going to clip this up to go to Facebook, too. Oh, nice. Because that's where a lot of my views come from, especially with the narcissism topic here. I've even started a new channel with YouTube as well. But we are live now, by the way. And um, mm -hmm. But that was pretty cool that because my whole channel, I've talked a lot of, about a lot of stuff, dating related, etc. Right. But the, the cluster B stuff, the narcissism, the borderline, that's all anyone wanted to hear me talk about. And so that's what I just kind of ran with. And I'm very interested in your thoughts about some of it, too. And for those of you who don't know out there, this is Ryan Stone. In my Hello, opinion, everybody. he is probably the most helpful person in what you may consider the manosphere. And <laughs> he was a moderator in the married red pill subreddit. And it's just helpful suggestions for guys that actually want to get past the fluff and get to some substance. I wholeheartedly recommend Ryan's channel and his book, uh, Praxology, Volume 1 Frame. And we're going to get into a little bit of that too. But how are you today, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Like That's I said, I just hope we make sure your audience gets, uh, we're doing this for what, two hours? Hope they get three hours of value from it. That's all I can ask. There you go. Right, we'll go however long it feels like it should go. Hmm. But um, so first, I was reading your thing about how in your book, unhealthy narcissism versus healthy narcissism. And you consider the male condition to be narcissism. Yeah. So maybe you could explain what you mean by that. Well, I guess here, I'll, I'll lay the groundwork of how this works out. So when you think about mental disorders, people think of them errantly as if they're a disease, right? Like you catch a cold, you catch the flu, you catch NPD, you catch BPD. It's not really how it works. Uh, psychology has never been a hard science. It's closer to chiropractic than medicine. So what they would do in, for example, when they came up with disorders and started developing the DSM to become like a proper science is they would take any psychological framework that they made. In this case, let's say narcissism. And we can get into definitions later if you want to. And they started interviewing people and mapping the traits and people's behavior to Bart narcissism. And they found that people fell along a bell curve. If you guys don't know a bell curve, most people are in the middle. And then as it gets to the edges, it starts to trail off in, in popularity. So you have your your first, uh, your first, uh, what the hell is it called? What's the word for it? First degree? Why am I having a brain fart on this one? Anyway, so most people, like 56% are in the first, oh, first standard deviation. And right, then they noticed those narcissistic traits were there. And then there was the second standard deviation. Then once you get to the third standard deviation, which is about 1%, give or take, of the of a population, they just arbitrarily drew a line there and say, anything past this point is considered pathological. And then they attach a, uh, a disorder to it. So narcissistic personality disorder is essentially extreme narcissism. And if you look at the traits of narcissism, there's two ways to look at it. There's one from the DSM or the uh, disorder uh, something manual. They're on version five now, if I'm not mistaken. They talk about a sense of grandiosity, um, thinking that you're better than everybody else, that they're just, you're just misunderstood and you're a secret king and stuff like that. And if you have certain amounts of these traits, they would consider you to have narcissism. The problem is that's like the same way of describing human being as a creature that has a liver, an eyeball, and a heart, but is missing the traits of a dinosaur, which also has those things. So it's not super helpful. And then you get to guys like The Last Psychiatrist, who is a really great writer, and you should really go check his work if you haven't yet. He's got a good blog on it, too, where he said the one thing that all the narcissists had in common was this sense of um, you built your own fantasy of who, what you thought you had as an identity. You make up an identity and then you psychologically demand fuel from everybody else. So reinforce that fantasy. A great example is like idiots out there calling themselves alpha males. They have an image in their head. Then it's always about symbols. What the symbol is of this. You could basically replace alpha male for like godliness. If it was like a guy from the 1950s and it was like super Christian, right? And then if people don't reinforce that fantasy they they don't do narcissistic fuel it's called a narcissistic injury which causes the person to go into a narcissistic rage which is a different emotion than anger now the whole point to all of this stuff is if you take these the way i've described it here as like a pathological set of behaviors and you dial it from a 12 to like a four you start to notice that's a lot of what guys do you know a guy that's super confident walks out talks cock talks cocky about his stuff girls like him guys want to be him 
life of the party. He tends to develop his own identity. The only difference is instead of him just making it up, it usually comes at the back of like several successes. Captain of the football team, he's the rock star on thing. He kind of earns it's the difference, right? And since it's not a pathological level, if somebody tries to injure that, say, oh, you're not a real rock star, you're not a real captain of the football team, then it doesn't cause an injury because it was built with actual work. And so when I talk about, and my arbitrary distinction between healthy and unhealthy narcissism is really based on whether that self-identity is earned or invented, which is really similar to the distinction psychologists would make calling it uh, pathological or within normal standard deviation. Does that, does that explain it well enough? I tend to ramble when I get on a roll. No, I think that's a good explanation for it. The fact that it doesn't need to be reinforced by others in yeah. the, like as narcissistic supply. It's good on its own without the external validation. I like exactly. that definition. And it's a I good one. Well, like I mean, it's not even so much is it a good definition. It's, just a, it's useful, though, because then you can understand it for yourself. Like as a guy, if... Like I use the example of like traditional conservative white picket fence stuff all the time. The white picket fence is like a horrible narcissistic fantasy because it was based on like 1950s cigarette ads that don't exist. The white picket fence. And so guys pick the symbols for that. Well, I need my wife to be a stay at home wife. She has to wear aprons. Meanwhile, there's like porn out there of girls dressed in like the, <laughs> the Wojak waifu dress baking cookies right. and stuff like that. I'm trying yeah, not to swear. So if I can just fly, let me know. <laughs> oh, you're good. You're good. But I yeah, so everybody thinks it always has to be like the Andrew Tate out there talking about G stuff with his cars. But no, it's that same type of guy who wants his white picket fence and he attaches himself to all these different symbols of that. And when somebody attacks that, like, I don't know, progressives, for example, it gives you that same kind of narcissist. That's why you see a lot of the discourse about how a man should live and what he should do with his family is so toxic. It's because you're essentially having two narcissistic fantasies butting heads and everybody's raging out against each other. Meanwhile, if there's like, I have friends that have, you know, two kids, a really nice home in the suburbs. They're having a great time. They don't buy into any of this stuff. And they're technically closer to that tradcon fantasy than anybody. The difference is they don't have that fantasy in their head of what they have to live like and what everybody else has to reinforce, you know? Sure. Another yeah. thing I liked that you had said in the book was how when you're with a woman, you want it to be her co-authoring the narrative with you as opposed uh -huh. to some sort of set piece or yeah. an archetype and i think that's a good one because when you think they're a set piece when you think they're just going to be an archetype when they don't meet that fantasy like we see a lot of dudes that wish the women were the 1950s women when yeah. they don't meet that standard then they're setting themselves up for uh disappointment and they get very Not even disappointment a resentment a rage i hear a great yeah. example of that is a lot of guys, they get together with their girl and maybe they maybe they don't have like, you know, much experience with women, but they found the one they want to keep her. And then they find out she's got a bit of a shady past. So let's use anal sex as a good example. It's a great example because it's so controversial. Guy never had anal sex with his wife, doesn't want anal sex with his wife. It's never even occurred to him to like go for it. It's just never been interested to him. But let's say then he meets an ex an ex boyfriend of hers from college, and they used to do that all the time. But now she's like, you know what? I'm not that kind of girl. I tried it. I didn't like it. I'm not a big thing anymore. So again, part of how these fantasies develop is the guy's like, wait a minute. So I devoted my life to you, kids, family, house life, all that stuff. Meanwhile, he got to have anal sex with you for free, and then he feels betrayed by her because you should be wanting to do that with me. Never mind. He didn't want it five minutes ago. Right. It's that whole idea that you're giving her 100% of you and she needs to be that fantasy to fulfill that gives 100% back. And then when you see that's the attack, it drives guys to want something that they never really wanted. So if you have more of a healthy narcissism, you get the relationship you want. Those kind of things don't matter as much. If you wanted a certain type of sexual thing, you would have had that as a non-starter before the relationship even started. Sure. And then, yeah, that's, but that's the problem is that guys are so worried that somebody else is getting it. Why do I have to pay for it when they got it for free? And there's this resentment cycle that builds up, which, again, it's a lesser form of that narcissistic rage. So once you kind of go down this rabbit hole, you really understand, you start to understand that when people talk about narcissism as a psychological concept, it really does map so well to, to men and masculinity. And it really helps you open up your eyes and see all the stupid things that we do that we really don't have to just because our egos are driving the ship instead of, you know, us. Right. Yeah. 
The other two things I like that you said in there was unhealthy narcissism is the antithesis of frame. And there's no worse breaking of frame or losing of frame than violence when you have oh. to resort to violence. <laughs> You're I never thought of the trigger points here, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah the those violence. are all the points that stood out to me. That I think is very interesting. Yeah. Well, the violence one is easy because it's men have violence as a, like from an evo psych standpoint our, our caveman brain violence is how we solve problems anger is a male emotion in that way because anger is our it's actually one of the rare social emotions out there it's that you have to have a grievance and a pain like nobody ever yells by themselves in alone in their house if you stub your toe you're hurt but you're not angry but if your wife drops a hammer on your foot on purpose you get angry so the whole point of anger is it's a social signal to let the other people around you know whatever's going on, this ain't on, and I'm gonna resort. To, I'm gonna go to escalate this to violence if you guys don't fix it. Which, and as a society, we've civilized and we've kind of said no, we don't want to live life based on like anger and violence. And you know, I'm not gonna argue that we should. I don't think so. I kind of like not having to worry about Thunderdome every time I leave my house. <laughs> but at the same time, now that you've made that socially unacceptable, legally illegal. Like there's all kinds of consequences to it. Once you get to that point, you're basically saying I've reached a point of desperation where serious consequences are no longer a concern to me. So for a guy with frame, you have to understand, like if I can't control the things in my world to the extent that I don't have to go to extreme measures, then I've, I either don't have the right tools or I've put myself in an impossible situation I shouldn't have been in. So in this case of frame, it's yeah, it, you, you resort to violence when you literally have no other options. And for most guys, there's so many options out there. There's so many tools you can put in the toolbox. The fact that they're resorting to violence so quickly just shows they're they're just ill prepared for the adult world. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And there's so much to it. Like easy example, just not taking your wife too seriously. And guys hate this, but I'm like, yeah, just don't take her seriously. Well, she's yelling at me and she called me names. It's like, yeah. She's also hungry and missed a little night of sleep and she hasn't had sex in like two days. She's going to be cranky and she's going to run her mouth because that's what chicks do. Right. <laughs> like if your four year old called you a big fat poopy head, what are you going to do? Are you going to drop kick her through the drywall because she disrespected you? Or are you going to laugh, no. give her a rub on the head and kick her out of the, get out of here, <laughs> go get something to drink, get out of my face. That and I think guys, man, yeah. So why is it so any different with a wife? Like what's she going to do? Is she going to fight you? Probably not. And if she does, you're going to win. I don't think many wives can beat up their husbands. So you already know, worst case scenario, she's going to use mean words and scream and cry. And it's like, eh, like I've had worse. Maybe, maybe it's the military in me, but I've been yelled at before. She's not even very good at it. <laughs> well, it's good to be able to handle it like that too, right? Where yeah. you have in your book about the oak. And another thing about the frame is anything outside of your frame is funny, intriguing, or, or amusing, amusing or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a great... That's a great, as you would call it, a mental model. That's a great mental model, not mindset to have in regards yeah, to no, that. No, I hate, I, dude, I hate when people, I don't, I know you use it probably. I hate the idea <laughs> of mindset because it's, it's, it has this underlying idea of you change the way you think about things and it'll change the way you act when it's completely reverse. You change how you act and it changes how you think. So when I say I like mental that. model, I'm using that specifically because we think in narratives. Back before we had written language, we used to share stories, you know, like Homer, Iliad, Odyssey, all that stuff. So we always, we're always built on stories. A mental model is a narrative structure we hold in our head to be able to anchor our decisions to because it takes too much energy to individually evaluate everything we need to decide on. Christianity, great example. Like, remember, what would Jesus do? That's a perfect example of a mental model. You're in a situation, I don't know what to do here. Well, what would Jesus do? Well, Jesus would do this. And then you go and do that. That's the easiest example I can think of, of showing somebody what a mental model is and what its purpose is. The good Samaritan, uh, any, any, uh, the prodigal son, any religious parable you can think of essentially functions as a mental model. And back when it was invented during, or back when, sorry, back when it was written during the, the bronze age, you know, zero AD agrarian societies, it really helped people make better decisions in their life. Now, I make an argument that now we're in the Industrial Revolution and the Information Age, a lot of that stuff isn't as useful as it could be. So what's to stop us from just finding help, more helpful mental models? 
And I don't want I don't want to call that mindset change because mindset just kind of like, well, I'll just think about it and it comes true. It's like, no, it's more so just what's a useful way to frame things. And that's kind of why it's called frame. Like, how do you frame your world so you can anchor better decisions to it and have better outcomes? And that's right. really the key, because if the outcome sucks, then it really doesn't matter what the heck you're talking about beforehand because you're still, you know, divorced or sad or <laughs> dry dick or whatever you want to call it, you know? <laughs> well, you're very pragmatic with it, too, where you say if thinking the moon is made out of cheese will make some guy work out three times a week and be fit, then, yeah, yeah by yeah. all means, the moon's made out of cheese. And I think there's a lot of different other kind of topics we can apply that to. Right? So Everything. say, like, trauma is a child. Yeah, that might not be the best thing, but if you frame it differently, oh, it can have a much better impact on your present as opposed to just being a victim of it. Yeah, well, think about how they do it now. They tell people you were you were manipulated or you know abused as a child. You need to go see therapy. You need to get drugs. You need to do this. You need to do that. And essentially, they boxed you into this identity of an abused child. And then, right. I mean, I don't think I have to bring up examples of people who identify themselves by their victimization and how it messes up their outcomes, right? I mean, we watch the news. You see that. Anytime somebody portrays themselves as a victim play sympathetic essentially it's a giant bullying campaign but they latch onto that that means they're above not a very good outcome in some cases it is but it's not really the outcome that i would find preferable as a guy as a girl you might be able to get away with it because you know people are sympathetic to women but yeah as a guy yeah this stuff sucks don't get me wrong i'm i'm not the first kid that got smacked around by their stepfather and i guarantee you i'm not the last but once you refuse to to model that situation with the mental model of of a victim and instead you play it as like it toughens you up, right? Like, okay, you know, I got through this. No matter what else happens in life, it's not going to be worse than that. And it just turns the volume down on everything. And then you realize you don't have to react when your wife calls you whatever she wants to call you. Because you just kind of, you know, chuckle to yourself. It's like, that's adorable. She really, she's not even top 10 in yelling at me right now. So you laugh, you give her a rope on the head. It's like, get out of here. And it's, it's addictive. Or not addictive, it's contagious. So you're, I've had this good example of how you holding frame can help the people around you. So for example, my wife, uh, standard thing, had to get up middle of the night, go to the bathroom. Uh, I had the toilet seat up. She comes into the bedroom later on, just pissed off at me. You left the toilet seat up and I fell in the toilet. You stunned. And she's yelling and she's screaming. And I'm just laughing. <laughs> it was the funniest thing I ever heard of. Like, how do you not look first? And so she's yelling, and then the, lard, the louder I'm laughing, the louder she's yelling until finally she stops yelling and starts laughing with me. Because it, it really is like a completely silly example. And that's like a, a nice, fun example. And you master it, right? That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just you're, you're, you're amused by the situation. It's outside your frame. Me sitting here getting berated and called a bad man because I left the toilet seat up accidentally and she didn't look before her, to me was funny. And I found it so funny that my frame won out and now she finds it funny. You know, still and they put the toilet seat to down. That yeah. <laughs> What's that? And they want you to win that battle too. They well, don't they don't seem to mind it when you do. You I'll say that much. <laughs> What's that? They, they won't mind it when you win. That's that much is for sure. Right. That's what they want. They don't want you to be sucked into their anger and their frame of the situation. They'd rather be pulled out of it nine times out of ten. Yeah. But the weird thing is that only works if you don't care if that's what she wants or not. Because as soon as yeah. you start to care about that, you start to fall in their frame and it becomes more of a pandering thing. And I know this seems weird. It's like, how do you not care, but then care by not caring? It's like, right. you have to experience it. There's no, the English language just isn't good enough or I'm not a good enough writer, possibly both, to articulate that. Which is kind of, and I have, I think the catchy saying I had in the book was like, got a hater just a little bit. Sure. Like not a lot, just, just enough to where you don't want to pander. You don't want to coddle. You don't want to be validation seeking. You don't want codependence. You just literally all that exists is your frame. And if she provides value, she can come in and enjoy this awesome life you've built for yourself and then just do whatever work gets you there. Right. I but like yeah. what you said in the book also, where you said no woman is going to be sexually attracted to a man that's too invested in needing her approval. I think <laughs> that needs to be on the top of all sorts of codependent dudes and probably like blue pill guys too. They need that. Oh, they hate it though. Home. They hate it. Have you not seen me well, on Twitter? Have you see, not seen the hate I get? <laughs> you do. I mean, you troll yeah. them a little bit too, though. But that's part Fair. of the engagement. And um, 
But it's true. If you're too invested in their approval, nothing turns them off fast for sure. Yeah. And you've just handed over the weapon. That's it. Like, she's like, oh, so if I want a new Louis Vuitton purse, I just got to tap into this need for validation. I wouldn't, you're not a real man unless you buy me a purse. And then the guy, his identity is wrapped into that validation. So he's like, well, I better get it. You know, happy wife, yeah. happy life. And a lot of guys don't make that. Even when you mention it, they don't make the association. The funniest thing I ever see is when, like, a guy will read my book or a lot of the, the material I talk about that gets you to this place. And they can tell you, you know, don't be validation seeking with your wife. But then they'll go home and they'll it, they'll actually be validation seeking to their wife. And then when they describe it back to you, they'll talk about, yeah, I didn't seek validation. I didn't do this. I had frame. And then they describe the exact opposite. So it's <laughs> almost like a two pronged thing. You have to intellectualize and understand it. And then you actually have to map it to your behavior. And most guys fail at the mapping it. That's why you can get guys who, for example, will quote like Rolo Tomasi's work verbatim but at the same time crumble as soon as a girl winks at them or something stupid like that. Right. And that's really the trick. Sure. And like I said, the only way to get there is you just have to practice it with like a devil may care attitude. Otherwise, yeah, it's, you don't want to be one of those guys that, you know, talks out of one side and can't walk the walk or pick your metaphor. Sure. I don't even know. Sure. Well, it's like, you know, as coaching guys, one of the short tail signs, and I learned this from you, that a mm. guy struggling with codependency is they're talking to you. And all they're doing is talking about their girl the whole time. Yeah. Like, yep, you are in her frame 1000%. And I've taken that and it happens all the time. People reach out yeah, to I me. I bet you can't not see it in your groups now, can you? <laughs> now, yeah, you've cursed me with that. But, not, but it was good, though, because now I see it. And women do it, too. They come, oh, Jared, you need to talk to me. You need to talk to my husband. You need to do this. And I was like, yeah. same kind of thing. Like, they want to help the other person more than that person wants to help themselves. Yeah. And you just can't like they, they'll fight you every step of the way. They'll get mad at you. They'll blame you for problems. At best, you'll get lip service. Yeah, man. Thanks. You wouldn't believe how many people are like, thanks, man. You saved my life and then leave. I never see him again. Don't change a thing. Come back six months later. All right. Remember all those things you said that I shouldn't do. And if I did do them, this would happen. Well, I didn't do them and the thing happened. So now what do I do? And at this point, you're just like, this is the consequences of your action phase. Like all the decisions were made now, man. Enjoy. <laughs> enjoy the divorce. I don't know what to tell you at this point. You know, the other thing you got me thinking about was how you said a guy who's not having his frame tested, not in a relationship of some sort with a woman, they're going to be more like the granite as opposed yeah. to like the oak that can bend with the wind a little bit. And yeah. that did get me thinking too, because I think I've been guilty of being more of the person that I'm single and I can always just walk away. So the frame doesn't get consistently tested as much in that scenario versus yeah. when you're in it and you're not going to leave, especially if you're married because there's consequences if you leave. So you learn to bend a little bit and it actually makes your frame stronger being able to do it like that. Well, not even so much bend. It's just stress test. Like okay. it's very easy to tell a guy. Yeah. When a girl's yelling at you, just don't phase you. And a lot of guys are like that. If you're dating a girl, you've been dating for a month, she starts yelling at you, you're going to look at her confused like, dude, we're not there yet. And then you just go off, right. do your thing. But now you got a wife, you know, I married you. I made the decision that you're the one. And then she starts yelling at you. And you're like, well, I made the decision that she's the best woman in my life. Something's wrong. I got to fix it. And you stop thinking about it the same way. Or she's the mother of your children. Now it's like, dude, everybody knows that guy who's with the girl that he can't stand. And you know, he can't stand her. And he knows he can't stand her but he loves his kids. And he's like, if I don't tuck them in at night, they're going to die. They're going to end up in stripper shoes in like 10 years. So I have to stay here and put up with this. It's again, it's another one of those unhealthy narcissism. I call it martyrdom where their image is them of like the poor downtrodden father who's sacrificing everything for the kids. And in reality, he's just too scared. He's just too scared of not seeing them. And unfortunately he's made the decision that being a good dad you know, trademark is more important than raising good kids. And the problem is when the kids turn 18, you're going to see the results of that. And then it's why you always see those guys, you know, the ones that are always on TV, like I love my kids. And then the kids like a, I don't know, some fuck up of, sorry to swear, some mess, some guy who screwed up his life in some way. And the dad starts getting real sad and crying because he's like, I sacrificed everything for him. But then the kid didn't learn from the sacrifice. He just learned from dad. Well, I'm just going to be a pushover and let people walk all over me. And then when he grew up, that's the lesson he got from it. And dad doesn't make that association. So the plow. Horse. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The plow horse. And they don't remember that when a horse is done, they don't give them the nice stable. They send them to the glue factory. <laughs> that was from a ranch. We've done it. We've done it. <laughs> yeah. so here's a good question for you. How do you think the mental health industry is failing men right now? That seems to be a pretty popular topic. Oh, did you watch? I had a debate with this with a uh, fourth wave feminist, which it's like feminism, but with an apron. I don't really understand you it. Not yeah. Sure you done? Yeah. I don't really you know, know who she it? is. I don't, she might be a big deal. She might not. I don't know, but it was like probably the most frustrating thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, where are we going with this? Oh yeah. The debate on, sorry, what was the topic again? Not uh feminism, um, but about how mental, the mental health. Oh, the mental health. Yeah. It's just, it's failed on so many levels. Partially it's, it's in over investment. Like you've gone to school for eight years to get your psychiatry degree or psychology degree. And then you have to buy into the system at that point. You can't say there's problems in the system because you've devoted a 10th of your life to it. And so your ego won't let you admit that maybe I wasted my time. So there's that part of it. Another part of it is the financial aspects. If you are doing therapy, you're doing talk therapy. And women come back for talk therapy. They love to talk through their problems. That's mostly how women process things by language. And so for you, you'll get 10 visits from them. And then you'll get 10 times the things. For guys, we don't really want to talk about our problems. We want, it's usually our problems are an environmental problem. Somebody is doing something or something has happened outside of us that's causing us emotional distress and we need to deal with that. And it's almost like a problem solving thing. Psychologists don't do that. What are they going to do? Tell you how to negotiate a better salary with your boss or how to quit your job? Not really. They're not qualified for that. So they default to the talk therapy and they'll get their 10 visits there. Now, some might know like this talk therapy is not helping them, but it, it's good as a placebo. It makes them feel better about how crappy a situation is. But the best ones that stay in the trade for the longest time are the ones that can do enough mental gymnastics to believe that this is actually working. And the problem is they're just not listening hard enough or something like that. And so you have this like self-selecting feedback loop. And then you add to that the drug side of things. Like I was amazed when I found out um, there is a, it came out in like 2012-ish. There was this psychology or psychology recertification thing. Basically every couple years you sign up to this, you keep your shrink credentials up to date with the new things. Out of the 400 question exam that these guys take for certification, not one question about Xanax, Ativan, or any SSRI. Like the most prescribed medication in America. 80% of, of people in the mental health industry are on SSRIs. And they didn't devote one question to it for a certification. And then you kind of realize like that's kind of messed up. The most common thing in your profession, it's like firemen. The one thing they didn't talk about was a fire extinguisher. It's like, really? <laughs> But then you find out that's the reason why is because now they can just point to policy. If there's anything about psychology that doesn't work for somebody, well, they can just call blame it on the policy. I was, I was doing my job, which that didn't work in the forties as an excuse. And I don't think it should work now, but I'm not, I'm doing my job. It's the, it's the program that's wrong. It's a certification that's wrong. So now it's nobody's fault and everybody's making money and everybody feels good that they're making a difference, but the outcomes are just horrific. Like how many stats do we need to point to? Are men doing better? No. And the ones that are doing worse are doing a lot worse. And the ones right. that are on drugs are on SSRIs. Dude, imagine a shrink prescribing a guy who's psychologically distraught in a marriage because of a lack of a sex life, prescribing him SSRIs. And if you guys have never been us or SSR, if you've never been on SSRIs, don't. They will numb your dick. They kill your libido. <laughs> Honestly, if you're on it right now, try getting off of it and then go rub one out. When you're on SSRIs, it's like you have to beat it like it owes you money. It's absolutely ridiculous. Now imagine that. If I had just told you this, oh, you're having a problem with the sex life with your wife? Well, here, this will chemically castrate you somewhat. Thanks, doc. Like for that reason alone, I'm just like so annoyed for it. And then that debate I had with her, she refused to acknowledge that at all. And I'm like, you're here for the benefit of men. It's like, yeah, I'm here to help men. I think mental health thing does it. It's like, Start with the fire extinguisher, Mr. Fireman. You know what I mean? Right. So, yeah, I don't yeah, agree thing. with a lot of it. I don't want to sound like Tom Cruise either. Don't get me wrong. There's good parts of the of the research out there as far as mental health goes, but it's practical application. It's just dog shit. Like, swearing. Yes, no. I got it. That's fine. It's fine. Okay, good. But, I'll, um, I'll try not to go hard, but 
I am a sailor yeah, after I, all. <laughs> yeah. There's no there's no rules in that regard here. But with yeah. Nasser Erudite there, she was saying how like the male therapists are a little behind, but there are some maybe that'll be good. Oh I yeah, that... <laughs> men please... need action first, right? Action yeah. first before any sort of uh, mind and mood altering drugs. A lot of men's problems with different actions could be much improved. It just depends, right? But they got to put in that action first. Maybe yeah. it's sleep diet exercise. Maybe it's a better community. Maybe it's hobbies. Maybe it's friends. But do Maybe all it's your that job. It really first. sucks and you need to be doing something else. Yeah. Well, eliminate bad things first and then add new good things. And if something's still wrong after that, then I say, okay, explore other options. I don't care if an SSRI works for somebody. If it works, it works. I'm not going to tell you don't do it. But I think that should also be the, like the last resort. That kind of thing should be the last resort only when other things haven't worked already. Here's another one that'll boggle your mind. Define works. I've asked this to people. I, I don't, I, I'm curious question. what your answer is, but I always ask people, what do you mean it works when they say sometimes it works? Like, I'll let you know what I the conversations go like, but I'm curious how you would think it means. when Emotionally, it it more emotionally stable with um, less depressive symptoms. I guess that's what I would consider works. It makes you feel better. Yeah. It blocks the symptoms. It doesn't actually fix anything. It just makes you feel better. I can't, I think that's my one catchiest saying I have is like, your feelings are shit and you should feel like shit for having them. It's like, who cares how you feel? You're supposed to feel that way because you're in a horrible situation. Coworker, back before this, I was working corporate downtown Toronto. And I remember this. Uh, he was talking about his family. He lived way off and like, it was like an hour commute every day to come downtown. Because his wife wanted a big house so they could raise a family. And I go, well, that sucks. You know, you're because he's talking about how he's always stressed out. He has a 90 minute commute each way. His life was basically stressful. He's stressed out. He's on SSRIs, that kind of thing. It's like, geez. So like, does she works though and trips in? It's just what you could afford. She goes, no, she stays at home. She just takes care of the kids. And, and he's like sacrificing himself because he had this image of, well, I'm a family man. I need kids. I better move to this place here. And he put himself in all this psychological distress to try and make everybody else happy. It's what I call lighting yourself on fire to keep everybody warm. Uh, and I, I had to back off the conversation because, you know, that have you ever looked in the guy's eyes and you see where kind of like a reality sets in and it's not pretty. Like, I remember this in the military. I had a guy crying in my office because it was like some charges and that. I don't like the experience at all. So I knew it was coming. I'm like, all right, I'll see you Monday, man. But yeah, so for a lot of these guys, sometimes these are really hard decisions. Like, what do you do? when your family wants a certain quality of life and you can afford it, but the cost to you just isn't worth it. You're not, you're absent at home because you're all stressed out. You probably, you know, you probably drink more often than you should. You're probably not happy with your kids. If anybody takes advantage of your, of your sacrifices, you tend to get resentful. Like there's sometimes options of get rid of all of this stuff, down pair your life to something that's more affordable and something you can emotionally live with. Most guys don't want to do that because that would piss off the little girl. And they always worship right. women. And that's like the one mental model I've noticed guys have where they treat women like the golden calf, you know, the woman of Willendorf. It's just deification. And so a lot I'm of it sure is just getting the guy well, to the man. point that, but that's when they'd be like, I, you know what? I'd rather have pills. I'd rather just have the pain go away and I'd rather feel better. And it really, the psychology, psychiatry, mental health profession is really designed. And I think guys like Rollo really do have it right. It is about, um, putting men on the plantation, like make better slaves out of them. I know it's hyperbolic to say it that way, but there's some truth to it. There really is. Um, I like how they say depression is an indicator that you need to do something different. I do Just, agree with that first and foremost. Yeah. If you see you're depressed, do something different. That's the indicator. Now, some people might eventually need to do the meds route, but I think go with the other action routes first is what I would say. And the other thing with you and not so erudite, the other big problem it seemed like she had was she was not for amoralness ever. Like she needed it to be for a great moral reason to do it. Well, anything. her like great, great moral reason. Yeah. And yes. that's what I think a lot of guys miss. Even when they think of like allies, like, oh, this girl's on my side or this one's helping men. There's a lot of cheerleaders doing that now. All they're really doing is they're doing what the old men's rights activist girls used to do. They just wanted to be, they just wanted to be the, the school marm. 
I think they have a new word for it now. They call it the longhouse. Have you heard of this term before? No, I haven't heard of this, no. Yeah, it's something new. A lot of these like uh, esoteric right-wing spaces have it. It actually kind of fits. It's the idea of a matriarchy. They just want a girl to be in charge. She sets the morality. And that has to do with how men and women talk to each other, which is like a side thing. For girls, it's all about the morality for them. They need to establish a moral hierarchy so that they can use that to, to get status within you know a social unit. And that's why they're, they're so pushing for that. And that's why they can't really help men. Because men, the morality isn't as important as efficacy. So for example, like that uh, guy I was talking about, he and his wife live out in the suburbs. He's miserable. He could make a decision to move closer to work to get a better commute or change jobs where it's closer to his home. And then they have to take a financial hit because it probably won't pay as well as downtown by the five banks. But that would require her to make a sacrifice. And he and then she'll be mad about that because why wouldn't she be mad about that? Somebody said, we can do this. And then he says, no, we can't. So you have to be okay with making your girl that you love more than anything, the mother of your children, angry because you're making a decision that helps the family. But in her moral framework, no, you're a man. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to provide. And that's the morality of it. And once you ditch the morality, it's like, look, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to be a better father for my kids. I'm going to be a better man for myself. I'm going to be a better husband for you. You're going to have to go without a Louis Vuitton bag and 100 extra speed of feet of floor space. And you don't. And she doesn't have to be okay with it. But that's the point. It's amoral. It's all about fixing a problem. And once you take that morality out of the equation... Like, you're still going to have a moral compass. Nobody's saying you're not. But for the work itself, you have to take it out of there and focus. Like, hunting, amoral. Or I think the example we used was just um, a guy who was cheating on his wife. That was the one. He cheated on his wife all the time. He came into the space because he's like, I can't talk about this with anybody else. And the stuff that he gave us was amazing. Like, how to know if your wife is cheating on you. Pro tip, you won't. Not right away. So stop trying to, like, you know, put GPS trackers in her car or play sleuth because it's not going to work. You just keep your eyes open and when it happens, like you'll find out eventually and what matters is what you do when you find out. Um, that there, how many wives are dissatisfied. So just doing what the consensus is, is probably going to make you more likely to be one of those miserable guys whose wife is cheating on him, stuff like that. But you would never have learned any of this stuff if you had just made a moral stance. Nope, cheating on your wife, you're out, get out of here, bring in the good men. And so you kind of need the amorality too because that's the best way to learn. Right. And I think the example I, think, I use, which I really don't ever use the example of like the, the Austrian painter from the forties. Cause like everything <laughs> we learned about hypothermia was based on world war two knowledge that they had tested, tested right. on a certain per type of person, horrible example of morality, great example of, of like amorality and practical application. But then as soon as you mention anything about him, it, you know, what's that Goth's law or whatever, or what's the law just where every board, internet argument has to go to like, yeah. Yeah. And I was just like, all right, you know what? You can have this one. It's not worth it. <laughs> but I was hoping okay. at, least, at least it seems like you got the point. So it wasn't wasted. No, I understand. I understand what you were going with it. Yeah. She just couldn't. No. She was going over her head. She couldn't get that part of it. And that's and she's, she's a perfectly good person, too. There's nothing wrong with her. She's a wife. She's stable. She's married. She's happy. And if like a good woman like that can't get past it. Your wife's not going to, like, your wife, my wife, they're not going to get past it either. And so you just have to not care. It's right. like, okay, you're allowed, like, she's allowed to be mad at you. She's allowed to not agree with this decision. It's still happening. You know, amusing, intriguing, funny. It's outside of your frame. Like, this is happening, and you need to come to terms with it. And if not, there's the door. But most women won't leave you when you make big decisions like this as long as they think and they trust it's for the betterment of the family. Right. And that's kind of where your frame is tested by the other person. Because you could be completely deluded and make a stupid decision and they will leave. And they should leave. People are reasonable. But sometimes it's like, all right, so I got to I gotta eat shit with a smile here for a bit because the family's going to be better off for it. Most girls who are reasonable and in love with you will, like, suck it up. They'll go without a haircut. They'll go without a purse. They'll go without some Louboutins for a couple months because, you know, your job makes you a better person when you're happy and not miserable and drunk. And that you can't be afraid. Also, so many guys are afraid guys, of that. They don't like helping guys with achievements or being aggressive. And it's like you mentioned in the book about how they've demonized dark triads by kind of tying it to traditional oh, masculinity yeah. traits. But they're not very good with that with guys. And no. I always tell guys, you got to see what frame of mind the person you're going to for help is coming from. There's like yeah. a feminine version of help 
which to me is usually more internal stuff. Like, oh, we got to focus on healing and connection. Yeah. But better. then there's another version, like an Alex Hermosi version. He don't give a hoot about that. He's like, no, let's go achieve. Let's go get shit done. And I think that for a masculine man, they do need that. They need some of that. You know, go get some shit done. Go achieve. Be a little it's aggressive. Alex Ramosi is this guy's name? Yeah, you've never heard of him? No. Dude, I'm Canadian. I haven't heard of it a lot. Oh, man. <laughs> Look at that. He's Look on... at that beard. So masculine. I like it. That's kind of funny. He, I'm going to go on the rabbit hole after this. Right now. He's huge right now. Oh, shit. Well, I'm going to have to learn about this guy. That's fun. He's uh, very good for business stuff. Like, he's no Manosphere guy, but he's, um, I've learned a lot from him about business and, uh, yeah, it seems that's what he's into. That. But no, it's good. My YouTube, I've been dying lately. I've, I don't watch a lot of, of content at all anymore, mostly because I find it's bad influence. It, it rot, the TV rots your brain. So when I find something that could be useful, I like latch onto it. I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> thank God, something I could consume. He's useful. <laughs> He's a moon's made out of cheese kind of guy. You'd like nice. him. Nice. Yeah, that'll be all but right. Say, Thank you. Look at this. Learning every, learning something new every day. <laughs> yeah, I try to. I don't. I listen to as many people as I can. Now, like you said, though, some aren't useful anymore, and I try yeah. to kick them to the curb. But I listen to you in the manosphere. I'll still well, listen to you. some Rolo. I don't listen to those rich as much anymore or fresh and fit. But I just try to go to the people that are going to push me because there's a lot of entry level stuff into that world, but not too much of the more advanced stuff. That's yeah. few and far between in my experience. Most guys don't know it. Honestly, it's I'm amazed. This stuff's been around for like a decade now. And I'm like the only one who had the combination of like the OCD to go look into it and the the financial freedom to make a living out of it by writing books and going on YouTube. Usually, because there's a lot of switched on guys that I know, but they're lawyers or doctors or outside as entrepreneurs, and they don't want anything to do with this space. Like, you would actually be amazed how many people that I would, like, coo over as celebrities talking to me, but they always, it's always on DMs, it's always privately, it's always, I'm not going to be associated with none of this nonsense, but thank you so much, you really helped me with this. And I was like, oh, that's sweet. I totally get it, because me just including the name Red Pill in some of oh, my dude. videos. <laughs> demonized me off the wazoo like women would look up my stuff and they would instantly block me just from seeing the words red pill i feel they wouldn't even tell me what was really going oh on. yeah dude it's but, like you just can't. <laughs> and that's where like the autistic thing comes into me too where it's like i get and understand a lot of the concepts but if you talk about them you run the risk of just being the misogynist the antiquated thinker that moral finger wagging, else. yeah. So I don't as much anymore. It wasn't doing me any good in my financial life either. So I said, what am I doing this for? And that's I when I gravitated you. towards the narcissism stuff. Because that's what people are hungry for. And I got a lot of uh, experience and knowledge about that too. But, uh, oh, that reminds me. Yeah, so yeah. you say female uh, borderlines the female condition. Yeah. Maybe you can talk about that too. Well, it's the same thing. And it's, again, you take the what's borderline and you look up uh, the DSM on that. And I'm, I'm simplifying it here, but it's essentially if narcissism is being the director of your own movie, borderline is being the leading actress. Like it okay. attaches itself to the identity of the strongest personality in the room. So when you see borderline traits like BPD, that's why guys all have that story of the dating the borderline chick. I thought she was the one. We fell into love super fast. She was all over me. The sex was great. And then one day it just kind of disappeared. But the same way as like coming off a of heroin, heroin you want to fix, guys were chasing these women that are treating them like absolute crap. But it's that same, those same feminine traits pathologized become borderline. So for example... And you guys could probably, you'll have to map this to your experiences here. But for me, it's, I've easily seen it in my life. A girl is really into you. She wants to marry you. She's your wife. You just got married, honeymoon phase. You'll notice that the things that you're into, she's into now. Like she never used to be into the San Francisco 49ers or the Raiders or whatever. But now she's watching games with me. Why is that? Well, she's just doing that because she loves you, which is not true. It's not that she does it because she knows you like it. It's that in her brain, it has a, a mate retention strategy. It's like a uh, instinct to actually convince herself she likes them. 
And then once you're divorced, she probably won't like them anymore. And she's with a new guy who likes, say, a new sports team. She will like that team just as much as she liked yours, and she'll forget you did it. Good example for me, how I learned is my is my wife when she was working. She used to work for a bank. And when she talked about the bank, it was always, we're doing this and we do that. I'm like, it's weird. Your job's not a we, but whatever. And then uh, I moved to Montreal with her. She owns the shenanigans. They kind of screwed her over. She left there and she started working for another big company. And then all of a sudden, the new company is we. And she couldn't give a shit about the bank. And so girls tend to latch on to things like that. And then with me, it was the same thing. Like, you know, one of my guilty pleasures, I love watching, like, there's these certain Minecraft Let's Play channels. I just love. It's my little Saturday morning cartoons. She loves them now, too. She never loved them when we met. When we met, she was a party girl. She didn't care about any of this <laughs> stuff. She never knew what a computer was. Now she's watching Minecraft Let's Plays giving me shit because she doesn't have access to my SMP server. And yeah, if, if heaven forbid, you know, I die and she has to go find another man... Her other man, whatever, if he's into, like, logging and baseball games, she'll get into logging and baseball games. It's just how women work. Right. But if you take that to a pathological level, that's where you get these girls that they fall in love with you the first time they meet you. And everything they do is perfect. And it's funny because it's the way they do it, too. I know this is a bit off topic. Let, cut me off if I'm going too far. Is, as a guy, we're stupid. We lead with our hearts. And when the girl's talking to us, they're subliminally interrogating us trying to find out what our likes are what our dislikes what is our perfect girl and because wow somebody's actually listening and wants to hear about this so their guys will tell her everything this is what i think the perfect girl is this is what she does this is it and then as a girl all she has to do again the borderline chick is like if i fill that role i am now the perfect woman and that's why guys fall for bpd chicks their game is perfect because they tell you exactly what you want to hear but then once they get it you kind of get bored. Well, I've already won this one. And then the high wears off and then they got to get mean. And that's why every guy's BPD thing is started off strong. Then she tried to stab me. <laughs> but yeah, it, but if you take that to from a pathological level to normal behavior, that's just a good wife that a lot of guys are like, oh, she's like my best friend. We like all the same things and stuff like, like it's not an accident. And girls hate that, too, because then they seem sure. to think it means that they have no agency and they're just going to latch on to whatever man and become his doppelganger, which isn't true either. Like, it doesn't fundamentally change who they are as a person. It just changes their interests. It's it's called mirroring. And it's a common psychological oh, yeah. thing. And everybody knows love bombing. it. Love yeah. bombing. I'd be love bombing would be, yeah, more of a path. The thing with love bombing, though, is it's more, it's, it's more deliberate. What I'm talking about is stuff that's in the subconscious. So, yeah, love bombing would be like an extreme, deliberate version of a, of a more subtle subconscious phenomenon. I know yeah, I've yeah. said that BPD is basically for women, female nature on steroids. Where oh yeah, all women Dude, you nailed have elements of it, but it's just times ten. That's yeah. how I try to describe it as guys to guys, and I guess like the cutoff for me would be it's like how long does it take them to get back to baseline after some sort of emotional upset? The guy or the girl? Longer than a day or so, you know, that's going to be a tough relationship to have with someone longer term. Because <laughs> the BPD people will split, they'll and when they split, they can go off and do whatever. Like it's just, yeah. it's not st stability. But normal. And then women what's the other thing? Darvo. Is it Darvo? They call it. Yeah, Doctor Romney says uh, defend, accuse, reverse victim, offender. That's the one. Yeah, so that kind of behavior comes out, and it's weird because a lot of guys they they get so attached. And there's another concept called intermittent rewards. It's really impressive where if you reward something every time it happens, people only do it when they want the reward. So if, a, if right. you hit, if you hit a button, you get a food every time you're only going to hit it when you're hungry. But right. if it only happens about, I think it's 25 to 30% of the time, you're going to have a compulsion to hit that button. And the, the BPD experience totally taps into that intermittent reward faculty, whether it's by accident or, you know, on purpose doesn't really matter. And that's why guys are so attached to these women that are just absolutely ruining their lives. Yeah, they get like it's technically why girls stick around with their abusers too. So, well, I guess it, it affects everybody. Me. Yeah. So you said in the book, like a ten out of ten psychologically damaged woman will be the woman that says, "Oh, at least when he yells at me, that's how I know he cares." But yeah. then there's a five out of ten woman that that's more close to normal. Like a lot of people are probably about a five out of ten, so yeah. they do like. A little bit of a dark triad they do a like bit. a little bit of that and you mentioned the examples of maybe slamming a door not really being uh 
outright Island, abusive yeah. or anything. But slamming a door, it reminds them of their dad growing up when he used to do things like that. So it kind of touches that button a little bit, but not really in a harmful way. But it serves yeah. that purpose. And you may have to be a little deliberate at it at first, which is, again, people don't like when it's artificial and I don't blame them. But if you've gone your entire life without having any of these attractive qualities, it's going to be a bit forced while you're learning them. But eventually you get to the point, and the part I like to say is the only reason it's called dark, like it only people think bad of it is because it's called dark triad. If it had, had any other name, people wouldn't think of it that way. But eventually you do it to the point where it's natural. And this is where a guy realizes, like, remember how everybody's always like, get in touch with your feelings? Well, there you go. <laughs> if you're If you're angry at something, you can be angry. You just channel it properly to the point that you don't have any long-term, you know, consequences. Right. You know, I mean, you don't kick your dog when you're angry at your dog. Like, you're kick, you kick yourself because you're angry. I and mean, I always tell guys, talk to other guys about your problems. You don't want to burden the woman too much with that because she has no experience with male problems nine times out of ten. Like, yeah. talk to your guy friends. They'll actually be helpful to you. And it's my same kind of issue with the female dating coaches, too. It's like, unless that woman's a lesbian. You're hitting all of the fucking. <laughs> she has zero experience dating women unless she's a lesbian. So I've only heard one woman say something to me, which I might understand. And she said, I tell dudes, and she's a female dating coach. And she said, I tell dudes the energy they give off to me when I'm with them. And I'm like, okay, I could see maybe where that could be helpful a little bit. Yeah. But for the most part. Go to a dude, talk to guys about guy problems, about women problems, right? Because they yeah. have experience. The other ones don't. Well, and they're capable too, right? Guys, friendship for guys is sacri is based on sacrifice. Like I've noticed this from my military time. My best friends, the ones I'll get on a plane tomorrow if they need me. It's usually because at some point in our friendships, they have put me in a position where I could fuck them over and I didn't. And they've done the same for me. And we put ourselves in that vulnerable position and not take advantage of it with women. Again, they're not men. Like, I don't think it's not even that she doesn't want to. I don't think they're capable. And it's not really their role as a wife. Your, your role is not to be my therapist. That's like my dad. That's my brothers. That's my buddies. And I think it's very, I don't know. I don't know if selfish is the right word, but it's definitely not useful when you try to give all these different social roles in your life to one person. Here, honey, I, not, I need you not only to be my lover, I need you to be the mother for the kids, I need you to be my therapist, I need you to be my best friend, and I need you to do, and like, why are you burdening her with all this stuff? That's not her role. She can't handle it. And girls will think about it as a status thing. If you're supplicating to her, you know, and being vulnerable generally is supplication, in her mind, she thinks of that as like a status competition. Well, now I'm better than him. Even if she's sympathetic, even if she believes you, she can't help it scorpion and frog stuff so at some point then she's going to start acting like your mother and then she's going to start treating you like a dependent and if there's anything unless you're watching the hub there is nothing sexually arousing about a dependent and mother role <laughs> yeah. it's a porn well, joke you mentioned that in the book too. the four styles of communication with women where it's like high status adversary oh, the quadrant yeah the harmony status, cooperative the quadrant i thought that was pretty useful too yeah, I, I, I do want to give credit to, to Venkatesh Rao, who kind of got me onto the concept. He was really good. He has a great book called Tempo. Uh, another one, Be Slightly Evil. And if you've heard of his work, it's probably from his one called The Gervais Principle. Okay. Anyways, you can mostly look this stuff, but they're really good. But yeah, for that, he just talked about open and closed communication. Open communication is what guys are used to. It's sharing information. You and I right now, this is open communication. You're telling me information. I'm telling you information. We're absorbing and moving on. Closed communication, on the other hand, is validation seeking, status, and uh, and friend enemy distinctions. And for a lot of guys, when you approach your girls, they approach language generally from a closed communication standpoint. It's about the it's about the process, not the actual communication. Guys, vice versa. So your wife will be talking to you about whatever, like she's bitching if you didn't do the trash or anything like that. And in your mind, you're thinking about this as an open communication problem logistically this is the problem i need to fix it but in her mind it's playing out and it's a good way to conceptualize it it's obviously not the most it's not the truest statement but it's very useful is when you're hearing her talk and you're assuming it's closed conversation put it on an axis on one side it's harmony is she acting like she's on the same team or is she acting like we're adversarial on the other side it's status who is she acting as if 
Like, who does she think is higher status in this one? And when I respond, who do I think is higher status? And then once you understand it from that way, you start to see the interplay, the subtext, and the the power games that women play and men fail. So, for example, right. your girl gets mad at you because you didn't do something. She's condescending the way a parent would berate a kid. So you'd like, okay, so she still thinks we're on the same team, but she's very mad at me like a mom would be. So she's higher status and same team. So what's your natural response to that? Look, babe, I'm sorry. I'll do better. I'll do better. You act lower status and on the same team. So you're essentially being submissive to her being condescending. And you, it's amazing how many things you can map to this. Or if you got like a wife that's about to divorce you, a lot of times she'll be, you know, condescending or indignant where you realize you're, you're adversarial and she's acting higher or lower status. And you keep trying to act higher status and on her team and you're just butting heads. And there's more than one framework too. There's also the, the, uh, what do they call it? Transactional analysis or TA, the parent adult child, uh, dynamics. It's another framework you can use. I like the harmony status cause it's just very simple and you can basically sort it out with a napkin where PAC, there's like a lot more reading involved in it. But then once you realize that, okay, this is where answers you give during an argument, like cocky, funny matter or amuse mastery, which are again, sure. tools from Glover and Manuel Smith. So your girl's like yelling at me over the toilet seat, same team, higher status. I fucked up. She's fixing it. I'm laughing because I realize what this is and I'm acting even higher status where I just think that's amusing. That's funny. That's cute, but we're on the same team. And then naturally it falls into a more stable, uh, social arrangement. You know what I mean? Now like high status reframe. Yeah. High status reframe. Like however you want to conceptualize it is fine. But at first you have to think about this every time you might even have to like, you get in a fight with your wife and you go home later or you go to your bedroom later, you write it down on a notepad, you draw a chart and you're like, oh, okay, so that's kind of how it went. And then you think about what responses would have been better or what actions would have been better. Sometimes there is nothing better. And just distancing yourself from the situation is all you can do. You know, chicks yelling at your kids. You don't want her yelling at the kids, but she won't listen. Take the kids, go get some ice cream. You stay home. When you cool down, we'll talk. Sometimes that's the best answer, but other times, yeah, it's laughing. Sometimes it's uh, amuse mastery is just the case of you act like, again, it's like a child having a temper tantrum and you think it's adorable and you already know what's up. Like this will happen. Um, agree and amplify is where you want to signal that the other person is being irrational and unreasonable, but without arguing about it. So you just take what they say and you draw it to absurdity in hopes that they kind of click in. It's like, okay, maybe I'm being a little off the chain here. Very Fogging exactly. is another example. Yeah. Sorry, keep going. Yeah. Emmanuel yeah. Smith does the fogging one. Who is that? The Glover or Emmanuel do the fogging and talk about it. I always that. get them mixed up on this. I always say it's Manuel's, Manuel Smith, but I sometimes yeah. screw up and it's Robert Glover. But between the two of them, I kind of, I consider them basically the same guy and both of those books to be quintessential <laughs> texts. So. No, they're both great books. They're both great yeah. books. The same like it's, they say on the sidebar, uh, what's it called? The Way of Superior Man. I haven't read that book for a while, but I read that one years ago. Did you like it? It is true. I, like well, I never... The masculine I, feminine part's true. Oh, okay. Like this stuff with the polarity, like a masculine essence, a feminine essence. He went into some tomfoolery too, I thought, which kind of went off the deep end. But the basics oh. of it, where it is talking about masculine being like the oak unflappable this kind of bending a little bit but not breaking kind of thing and i thought there was sense. a lot of useful stuff in it oh yeah no you're not wrong the only part that got me is it felt too much like he was trying to give me a pep talk and i there's two things i hate about books it's when they try to tell me how awesome i am or when they try to tell me how stupid i am <laughs> that was a uh, roman mcclay's book i tried reading his i don't know if you ever heard of this guy but the first chapter was just a hundred pages of him saying, I'm not smart enough to understand. I'm like, well, I'm not going to argue with you. And that was it. And then he murdered <laughs> six people. So I'm like, all right, fair enough. <laughs> there you go. Well, here's a question for you. So yeah, yeah. say someone stumbles upon the Manosphere world. They stumble upon Rich or Fresh and Fit or Rolo or Pearly. What would your suggestions be to them just about this whole space in general? Oh. Well, you know, I'm trying to think of like a diplomatic answer because just cussing them out is probably not going to work. Um, or Tate even, right? He's the big one oh, people would probably know. You know what it by. is? Yeah. What's I know in you this love for him, you? But... I think that's the only question. It's basically everything, including this. What's in it for you? Like when you're watching these people and you th they think they're tr like, we got you, man. It's not your fault. It's their fault. And you can do this. Just follow what I'm telling you to do. There's two things. What's in it for me? 
Tate was all about join his war room, pay $5,000 a year, and I'll teach you to be an alpha male with a Bugatti. So yeah, what's in it for you? Nothing. He just wants you to buy his stuff. Pearly, same thing. Pearly's in it for Pearly, and I'm not throwing shade. Good for her. But Pearly wants to be the most popular person in the room. Pearly does not want to help you. Me, technically, same thing. I don't want to help you, but I hate bullshit. So when I put this stuff in a book, it's mostly like an anthropological uh, understanding of the thing that guys have put in over the last 10 years. Rolo Tomasi, same thing. It's not that he wants to help you, but he really likes the work. And then you have to look. So what's in it for you? So if you read Rational Male, for example, you'll get a, a good 10,000 foot understanding about male and female relations. So that's something that's a benefit for you. Fresh and fit, what's in it for you? Well, I get to watch a guy who kicks a girl that looks like my ex-girlfriend off of their podcast. Like, fucking wow. Like, is that helpful or is it making you feel better? It's really just like a masculine SSRI. And so, yeah. You Unless go. you're one of those guys that gets off on indignation, in which case, fill your boots. And then the second thing on it is uh, there was this great guy who's smarter than me in this space. But again, he's anonymous. His name is Whisper. And he called, you must put this bucket on your head right now. It's a great essay. Essentially saying all people in life are trying to manipulate you into doing something they want you to do. Christians want you to become Christian. Catholics want you to be Catholic. Your boss wants you to be a better employee. Your wife wants you to be a real man. So they're basically, they have a bucket on their head. They're telling you how great the bucket is, that inside the bucket is everything you've ever wanted. You need to put it on your head right now, but you don't know what's in the bucket unless you put it on your head. So how do you do this without uh, committing to something that's going to be against you? And then the best example for that is just look at the other person. Has the bucket delivered on what they thought it was doing, or are they just proselytizing? Tate's a great example. Dude, I got 33 Bugatti, still can't get away. Like, you watched him with his bucket on his head. He's in a third world Eastern Bloc prison right now. And yeah, that's probably not fair. He's, <laughs> he's not the first guy that's been arrested, possibly unjustly, or maybe things are wrong, or maybe they're not doing it right, but he's still there. So if you follow that roadmap, he's your best cheerleader on that right now. Where is he at with that? Uh, Pearly, she's what, like 30? She's still single. She's not married. Like, if you want to have a good marriage and a healthy wife or a good relationship, is that an example you want to get from a single girl in her 30s? Fresh and fit. Like, where are they? Like, where is the result of their bucket on the head? And that's why I like Rolo's example. He's happily married, 25 years. His kid just got out of university. So, like, for me, when I was like, what bucket do I want to put on my head? Like, I'll check out what he's into. The results for him seem to have been all right. And then, yeah, it generally works out. Same with me. Like, I'm still a youngin. My girl and I have only been good to each other 13 years now. Almost 14. Damn, 14. You know, How old are you happy. Oh, I'm, I'm old. I'm not as old as old, but I'm younger than young. I'm like a first generation millennial. Okay. So I still eat avocado <laughs> toast, but I remember what life was like before the internet. But okay. if you ask yeah, any of the sure. women that get mad at me on Twitter, they'll say I'm 47. <laughs> <laughs> and if you ask any of the guys that like me, I don't look a day over 35. So I'm somewhere around there. I know. Okay. I know we'll see. I don't like to talk too personal about stuff either. Cause I, this is the other problem I have with a lot of these the brand ass models of Instagram brands is they make it about them. And I really make an effort to make it about the work, the work, the information, uh, the efficacy, the outcomes, and I, I do as little of myself as I can put into it because as soon as you make it about you, then everything rests on my shoulder. Like if I go do something stupid tomorrow and get arrested, for example, all the work I've done is now meaningless because now I'm that idiot who got arrested by yelling at Greta Thunberg with a pizza, you know? <laughs> and I would yeah, rather yeah, the work stay here tough, after I leave because I'm, I'm just a guy. I'm no better than anybody else. I'm no smarter. I'm no jackter. I'm no richer. I mean, I'm better than some, but worse than most, whatever. But the point is, the this shit works. Yeah. I didn't realize this definition of sex trafficking is what it was. Where if you do <laughs> like that method, like he did. Oh, the lover boy? Fall in love with you, I didn't realize that is by the definition they're using. It is sex trafficking. So at first, yeah. I thought he was going to get off. But he might get something thrown his way now. Not to mention he was saying how corrupt Romania is. So now they'll say, you know what? We'll show you how not corrupt we are. And we'll get and you. The, and they'll be, yeah. Too. Here's the thing. Um, I've had my own situations in my time in the military of like unjust imprisonment. And what he's learning right now is something called the process is the punishment. So right. they're holding him without charge right now. It has nothing to do with human trafficking, by the way. It's money laundering. 
I actually have a little more intimate knowledge about his internal workings than anybody should just because we've like, we've got so much interconnections. It's always like my big joke on my podcast showing that beef he and I had where basically he calls me an asshole for not liking him. <laughs> it, <laughs> it's all that bitch. Oh yeah. It's fun. I like it. Um, but so he was laundering a lot of money. He wasn't paying any taxes and he was showing it off to everybody. And the whole reason he moved to Romania was because it was a third world country, easier to bribe, more corrupt. And he was only thinking of the good side. Well, in London, I'd have to pay taxes, but up here it's fine. Not thinking the bad side is that if somebody wants you there, they're going to get you if they're powerful enough. And then there is no rule of law to protect you. So right now he's like, he's calling for, hey, I want the rules to start applying. It's like, well, part of frame is understanding the outcomes and the consequences of your decisions. So yeah, you may have to pay more taxes in Canada or America or London, but when shit hits the fan, you can rely on the rule of law so you don't get screwed over. So he made that decision and now he's there. Now, a smart thing to have done is if you're going to break the law, don't tell anybody. Why would you tell anybody to tell a bunch of people that you don't know think you're cool? Yeah, there's so many examples of what you can learn from that situation, but everybody's so focused on him as like a demagogue following him as like a sycophant, they're missing the very obvious examples of actions and consequence there. Sure. I and yeah, so like the bucket on your head, I think is a great example of this. Okay, focus. Yeah, he says all this great stuff. How did it work out? How's that working out for you? I know Patrick Bet David was interviewing his lawyer and she really? was saying how she's not allowed to even talk to him without it being recorded, which is <laughs> kind of shisty too. But like I can't said, believe the third world has a third world tin pot justice system. Color me right, surprised. Said, the process is the punishment there. So he can't talk to this lawyer in private. Mm -hmm. And yet that's part of it. That's part of the problem there for him. Mm -hmm. But could you imagine when he gets out, it's going to be quite the event one day when he gets out. Is it worth it though? I guess that's my question. Do you think it's worth it? Would you, would you be willing to go to a prison in Romania in order to like, get an extra couple followers and some extra money when you get out. I wouldn't. Yeah, I'm sure he wouldn't. Thing. He wouldn't think it's worth it either. He'll spin it yeah. that way when he gets out. But um, the most useful things he's ever said to me were just things he said for free. Just yeah. like he said some good things for free, but I was never a part of Hustlers University or the War Room or whatever. But well, a lot of it too was just stuff free. he ripped off from Rolo. He There was so many guys that used to just read the Rational Mail and pretend it was their own content and put it out. And that's most every time somebody brought up something that he said, I'm like, oh, that's the stuff that Rolo was talking about in 2012 or 2013 or 2014. So it's almost like useful knowledge, but you slap a clown on the front of it and like, there you go. Look at this, babe. The four yeah. tires are just kicking it like a used car salesman. I'm just like, yeah, well, I, I don't need the clown show, I guess, for me. I, I would much prefer it to be like a boring C-SPAN lecture on YouTube, you know, I like it when it's that boring. Was, I like it when it it's dull. Here, that was what the Manosphere was until not that long ago. It was pretty, besides Anthony Johnson, it was pretty basic and it was pretty just more factual, yeah. especially when it was online, I thought. It's not kind of, it's not very true. It's actually, country. it's always been like this. Like the Manosphere never existed. Manosphere was a term that came up in 2012. Mother Jones, I was telling you this offline, a Mother Jones was a feminist rag pre Jezebel and they hated this pickup artist named Roosh V and they wanted to lump him in with a lot of men's rights advocates like Paul Elam and that. And so they had coined and you know, he's like, pickup is totally different than this and they're right. And they just called him all the manosphere as a play on words for the blogosphere, which is what everybody was doing back then. So that way they could judge the space by its worst actors. Like imagine in your head taking, um, black women on YouTube, makeup tutorials, uh, rabid feminist hating men, and you put them all in a group together and call it the Femisphere. Like, it seems nonsensical. It's like, they have nothing to do with each other, but that's what they've tried to do to men. But yeah, it's always like that. So case in point, uh, Tucker Max, Mike Cernovich, uh, what's his name again? Who's the cuck article guide? Why am I drawing a blank on his stupid name? Jack Murphy, hey, Roosh V, yeah. Mystery, all these guys in the 2000s are doing the same thing. Jack Murphy was, and, and everybody had articles about like, getting your wife railed in order to experience good masculinity or uh, Cernovich's story about how he slept with a trans vestite, how it was the greatest sex of his life and he was into that stuff. 
<laughs> Tucker Max was basically he got this guy Ryan Holiday as his marketing guy, and a lot of the mar outrage marketing you see is from this first generation of guys. He actually faked an attack on one of his billboards and pretended it was feminists trying to get at him to build up drum up outrage to get selling on his book, and his book sold like hotcakes because of it. So a lot and of Ryan the stuff Holiday's you're seeing now was always here. What's that? And Ryan Holiday's his marketer, the guy who wrote the Ego yeah. is the Enemy. Yeah, yeah Ego the is the Enemy. You'll today. actually see it if you check out his book. Um, trust me. I'm not lying. Confessions from a media manipulator. He actually explains how all of this stuff worked. And once you read it, you're going to start to see it everywhere again. This is one of those ones where like, once you see it, you can't unsee it. So for example, like you talked about the Anthony Johnson good dust up stuff. At some point I realized like, oh my God, he's doing the exact Ryan holiday thing. He just really sucks at it. And so every time you would make moves, you can kind of understand it. Uh, another good example, Vox day, social justice warriors always lie. He actually talks about these guys that get caught up under cancel culture. It was the same outrage marketing, but instead of guys like Tucker Max applying it, it was like women applying it for the weaponization aspect of it. And then he would show like a roadmap on how to get out of it. And so this stuff's been around for as long as the internet's been around. It's just memories are short. And okay. where, yeah, the decade ago, it was Brittany, Brittany Venti, Roosh V, Tucker Max, uh, Cernovich. Today, it's like Andrew Tate and Fresh and Fit and Pearly. And then five years from now there's gonna be a whole other group of people that nobody's ever heard of doing the exact same thing now it's almost sure. just like it's the human condition we, we just love a good circus <laughs> they do it's entertainment it's the entertainment not I so much the, the substance and the stake as they say yeah and so you just kind of have to accept that we're just going to be a, a muddy filthy dirty people and grab what you can out of it and try and avoid as much of the clown shit as possible it's really the only thing you can do. Sure. So where do you see like the dating world going in the next 10, 20 years here? And this yeah. kind of coincides with like the black pill stuff here too. Cause that movement is getting movement, I say, but the group of people is getting bigger. And is bigger. it though? It I seems wonder about that this. way. It seems that way. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems that way. Do you know how easy it is to astroturf a movement nowadays? It's super easy. You get, Case in point, here's a Reddit example. I know it's like a horrible one, but bear with me. Uh, I remember this. People used to get mad. Every time I put out a Reddit post, people are mad and I get downvoted. Reddit came out with a blog talking about user uh, statistics and how they, how they interact with the platform. In the platform, they have a logarithmic algorithm, which means a vote, an upvote within the first minute carries 10 times the weight of an upvote at the 10th minute. And 100 of the wait of like after an hour or 10 minutes or whatever. Right? So what that means is if let's say you put out something that's super useful, but it takes you two minutes to read through and somebody puts out like a goofy picture of just wham and ain't shit. That one takes 10 seconds to look at you upvote it. You move on with your day. It already has a 10 times head start over something that's substantive and useful, but takes longer to consume. So right there, you get an undue amount of popularity to things that are easily digestible, lowest common denominator, and things that make you angry. Also, of the hundred people that view any view a post, one like or I guess out of a hundred percent of people that view a post, about two to three percent of them will engage with it. That means like an upvote or a downvote. And of that two to three percent, another single digit percentage of them will actually comment on it. And of those commenters, the reason they comment is predominantly like 80% is because they aren't happy with something. They want to correct information or they, they project some kind of anger onto it. So if you're a content creator making Reddit posts, all you know is that anything you build that's quality is downvoted and anything that is quick, easy, cheap pablum for idiots is getting upvoted. And then every time you put out something, it's just a ton of hate. So you get this inordinate worldview that everybody is hateful everybody is stupid when in reality it's just it's the environment is kind of set it up so it can't function any other way and so this is how i look at the black pill and everybody's opinions on dating there is just an, a very small amount of extremely angry terminally online people that are shifting the overton window of what we're perceiving is actually happening because like my patreon it's a smaller one there's only like 400 guys in there but none of this stuff has ever come up none of the problems with the dating world None of this. You have to have the newest iPhone to get a girl. None of this. Like any problem you can think of. No, nobody's ever dated a girl who has an OnlyFans account. Guys from their 20s to their 50s. 
not one has met a girl with an OnlyFans account yet. So it just leads me to believe that it's everybody filling their heads up with nonsense because the environment is designed to show them nothing but nonsense. And because our brains can't tell the difference between the internet and real life, we're assuming that's the real thing. In reality, it's going to be no different than guys in the 80s who had to learn how to online date. It's a new tool, but men don't change and women don't change. So I don't think dating is going to change. I think what's going to change is the tools. And if there's a fundamental change in the way information is spread online, like if algorithms change to favor something else, I think that'll change perceptions of it. But ultimately, you walk up to a girl, it's still going to be the same approach you did in like the late 90s if you were doing mystery method or the late 70s when you were wearing a leisure suit talking about whatever. I don't think any of that's ever going to change. Right. And the people that are so, online more and in real life less are going to be more extreme and stupid. But the people who just decide to go live life and go hit on girls, they're going to be just fine. So how would you talk to somebody that's starting to follow, say, Wheat Waffles, uh, Better Bachelor, Undead Chronic, these I kind don't. of guys? I what don't. Do talk to... I don't. Well, Let them I think they do Fuck need them. a little help, though. I think they that's just a got to... I... Covert contracts, probably the most important thing out of Robert Glover's work. If I do this, then they'll reciprocate and love me forever and I'll have a problem-free life. You know the one. I have never seen a bigger covert contract in this space, whatever you want to call it, than guys thinking, I can save them. It's just the, it's like, remember that? The, the crazy girl, I can save her. She doesn't want to be right. saved, bro. These guys don't want to be saved. And every guy I've seen who tries to, like Jordan Peterson, he came in wanting to help these guys. He said that. I, I think I can do some good. People are telling me I'm doing good. And then what happened? Audience capture. Guys that were angry, filled his head with nonsense. Guys like kept feeding them like, oh, you're doing great work and encouraged them to do more. And then they're like, hey, this audience really wants to talk about this. Well, they, you know, they like me and I'm helping them. So why wouldn't I talk about this? And then they've turned him into this weird brand that's almost wearing Jordan Peterson as a skin suit. And I fucking hate the audience for doing that to him because his, if you watch his old clinical psychology stuff, it's switched on, it's bang on, it's awesome. If you watch this clown show shit he's doing for Daily Wire now, I'm offended. What have they done to my poor Canadian boy, you know? I really enjoyed him. His Pinocchio work, his biblical lecture stuff. I thought he Yeah, was that great older guy. stuff, like pre pre his daughter becoming a brand of whatever the hell he's doing. But this new stuff, like take that woke feminist, like what the fuck is that? So when he's you ask, like, how do I reach these stuff. guys? You don't. In fact, not only can you not reach them. Do you remember how I was telling you before about a lot of guys who don't want to be associated with the space, but we're doing real work, like, you know, celebrities, higher tier people, whatever. All you're going to do is alienate those guys, the ones that just quietly go and fix their lives and have better lives and do good work and achieve great things. Because you're hyper-focused on, for lack of a better word, angry losers. Those guys are going to fail and they are going to hit rock bottom and they are going to take you with them. Let them burn. Save your precious amount of time you have on this earth. If you really do want to help people and do good, save it for the people that are helpable. Don't try to fix a charity case because all it's going to do, again, it's like trying to save a drowning man. They're more likely, if they can get a hold of you, they will push you down and drag you down to the, the bottom of the ocean with you. Yeah, Jordan let them burn. Say that. And I know it's not what people want to hear, but it's the only one, like, if you don't believe me, Go try it. I'll see you in six months. You let me know if I was right or not. I guarantee you. I guess you part of the reason I mentioned that is because there are people in the media. They try to yeah. amplify that black pill side and say, yes, they do. And it's easy to spell this and they'll drag yep. it into yep. school shooter, this and that. Yep. And they you know, blow it up and amplify. Just like I think the woke side, that's a probably a minority too. That's oh, also easily. blown up as well. So, like, have you ever met a trans person in your life? Yes. <laughs> I have. But, like, you probably know them all. Like, I've met two. <laughs> and both of them were in Thailand. <laughs> well, I've had an interesting life. I've been a taxi driver years ago. Before oh, fair enough. Before came around. So, so imagine if you people. were just, like, some guy who worked in an office somewhere after school. Like, you probably would go your whole life without seeing anything. And yet, if you watch TV, you think that every third person is a transition. It's completely out of it's proportion. It's a small, small percentage, right? I mean, yeah. unless you go to it, like in Canada, there maybe is like a gayberhood section, like by me in Philadelphia. There's a gayberhood. Oh, it's all of Toronto. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. And so they're there. They're there. 
but they're not. Yeah, like I'm not majority. saying they don't exist. I'm just saying that the the perception far outweighs the reality. And we have this inordinate amount of like time and exposure and everything on these people that fundamentally are almost like a rounding error. I'm not dehumanizing. I'm just saying to put it into perspective. Same thing with the, in the black pill incel guys. I put them in that same boat. There's just not that many of them that matter. There really isn't. And they're online all the time because they're not sleeping with women. They're not dating. They're not building businesses. So what are they going to do? They're going to find a bunch of people who believe what they believe. And they're going to gravitate to people who pander to them because nobody panders to them because they're unattractive and nobody likes an unattractive guy. And they're going to, and they're going to suck everybody into this horrible well of misery and they don't want anything else. Have you ever tried to talk to a guy who thinks he's a black pill guy? He's the most yeah. insufferable guy ever. You'll tell him yeah. about, he's like, yeah, if you're not six feet tall with six pack abs, you'll never get a woman. I'll show them a guy. I'll have a guy come out. He's like, I'm five foot six. I can, I've slept with this girl right here. He'll have like photos of it. And the guy will still argue with him. Yeah. Well, that's just because you have money. It's like, they don't want to win. They don't, they just want to seethe and they want to feel validated in how shitty their life is going and how it's not their fault. And it's because of a statistic or a graph. I just, and until they hit rock bottom, they're not going to want anything. So like, why would I waste my time with it? Why would you waste your time with it? I don't know if they're in, I don't think they're in your audience. You seem switched on. So I'm assuming you've got good guys in your, you know, groups that you associate with, but yeah. Have you ever had one invade your space? Have you ever noticed they kind of gravitate everything to nonsense? Years ago. Yeah, years ago. They're very, yeah. um, if you go against what they believe, they get very upset pretty quickly. Yeah. Even if you got a guy who knows what he's talking about, he'll argue with that guy to death. Don't let your experience get in the way of my imagination, sir. Right. It's like, why would you try to reach that guy? I think the last thing he needs is to be coddled. What I would say to those guys is like, hey, if you're going to live that life, without women go make tile whatever just do that don't yeah, like good. obsess yourself with uh torturing yourself and being angry about it just go live your life go live you your you life without women do you think you'll even try i don't often no often they won't do you yeah. know chris williamson um i know of him <laughs> because i was uh he was asking about who to or where to find good red pill people to speak to, people from the manosphere. I had mentioned you. I don't know if anyone saw it. Oh. So I was going to say, if you know anything about what he says and what his issues are with the manosphere, what you would say to him. Um, I know he just had a podcast with this guy, Alex Date Psych. Uh, I'm trying to be diplomatic about this one because I don't really have a problem with Chris or his stuff. It's just... Not a fan. I think he's a, got a set way of looking at things. Right. And he doesn't want to be convinced otherwise. And so it would just be debate for the sake of entertainment, not for the sake of hearts and minds. So I don't think it would be a use useful bit of my time or his. I think that's the safest way I can say this one. Does that make sense? Yeah, because he has a problem with like... Yeah, I know what he has. A I think he with. thinks it's a little too toxic, for example, and he gets annoyed at the guys who say, uh, when learning how to fish, ask the fisherman, not the fish. Yep. He kind of went off on that. I don't even understand why he took that hill to die on with it. But... He chose it. That's the really yes. easy answer. You ever see this? Everybody who argues online, they'll make a point. I don't like this group of people for this reason. And then that group of people will come and argue about it. Do they ever pick like the best example of it? No, they always pick the stupidest idiot who said the dumbest thing and they're like, see these guys that I can't stand right there. This is exactly what they believe. Everybody does that. When Democrats are mad at Republicans, they pick the evilest, most corrupt one they can find. Like, look at what they're doing. When Republicans want to yell at Democrats, what do they do? They find like some dude with a, with a, with an anal plug in there bitching about free cocaine or like, look at what they want. They're trying to take your kids and give them the drag Queens. Nobody ever uses good examples. They always pick stupid ones. Even that erudite chick, I asked her. She had all these wonderful opinions about the red pill, what we think. And I'm like, who the fuck have you been talking to? She's like, oh, I talked with Andrew Tate and Fresh and Fit. I'm like, well, there's your problem. But she chose to speak with those people. You right. know what I mean? She talks so she destiny. wants them to be, she doesn't want a discussion. She doesn't want to learn. She wants a bad guy. To, she wants an out group to point to her in group and say, look, those guys are bad. I'm good. I got you, fam. Buy my merch. And right. 
if I were I to do I anything with Chris something. Williamson, I have a feeling it would be more sophisticated and civil than that. But ultimately, that's what it's going to boil down to. Two in-groups fighting over who's the better in-group. Right. He, he doesn't <laughs> quite... Like men, like men and women, adversarial dating strategies. Yeah, you agree with in that? the macro. Absolutely right. in the macro, they're adversarial. There's so many examples of it. It's like, it's hard. If you're talking about science or research or anything, it's impossible not to. Like here, women, their estrus cycle is hidden. We're like one of the few animals that do that. Dogs know when other dogs are in heat. Why would women hide their estrus cycle? That's an adversarial strategy. It's an, ultimately a deception. On that fact alone, this should be a non-issue. But people don't like it because it makes them feel like, this feels like a moral condemnation of women. It's like, who cares about the moral aspect of it? It is. It's there. It's true. But if I'm well, sitting like, here having to argue that. biology with somebody who says, well, the biology makes me feel uncomfortable, then what? how productive is that going to be? Right. Well, it's like Rollo says, in order for one's uh, sexual strategy to succeed, another yeah. one's must fail. It is kind of like that to a point. Yeah, well, like extreme versions of success and failure. Of, of a successful uh, female... Technically, if you want to get to a 100% successful female strategy, it's to, to fall in love with the best man she can find, have kids with him, fall out of love with him, find a new man, and do it again. Because the different DNA that she gets from every different new kid makes her lineage more likely to survive in a case of like a, a plague or any kind of thing, right? Somebody will have a genetic ability to start, bite off some disease. Oh, this one's COVID resilient. She loses five kids, but five kids survive. So that's the ultimate female strategy. The ultimate guy strategy is to knock up every woman on the planet so that his genes replicate. So an right. extreme example, those two things are at odds with each other. But I mean, whose life is really like that? Nobody really. So we're all kind of caught in this middle zone. And we've generally settled on a good trade-off between everybody's sexual strategy is monogamy. Maybe a second husband, maybe a second wife. Maybe she cheats on you, but she's sure the baby's yours, maybe not. So we're always, everybody likes to argue these 10 out of 10 examples. But in reality, we're all like at four to six. And inside yeah. of there, there's so much overlap that we don't really have to be hyper fixated on the adversarial nature of sexual strategy. But we do have to be aware of it because it will influence the decisions we make. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But that's nuanced. Well, you can't tweet that out. <laughs> There's no, no way to understand it. You have to come to well, guys like you and actually learn. And it takes time and effort. LDR, yeah. I mean, you take pride in it too. You don't sell yourself out just to get to the to the masses. And like you say, it does hurt your engagement, no doubt. Yeah. But I've okay chosen to do the thing. It's like, it's it's like we were saying before. Like, what is your frame? What's my goal here? And my goal, I've met it. I'm selling enough books. I'm making the mortgage payments. I'm comfortable right now. Like I don't need a Bugatti. So right. I'm just not going to do things that cost me my reputation in order to get that little bit more money. Cause I don't need it. All right. So tell me where can people find you and your book? If they want to go check you uh, out. I love that. I got to do the pitch. I'm getting better at this. I hate the pitch, but I'm getting good. Praxeology volume one frame. It's part of going to be a two volume series. The second part is going to be about dread. Uh, that's coming out this year. So the ways to find me, Amazon has Praxeology. It's also out on every audiobook platform. Just came out this month. Selling like hotcakes, which is awesome. Also, my first book, uh, Fuck Files, 15 Lessons, or yeah, 15 Lessons from a Decade of Women. That was more about my sailing experiences and lessons I took from it. Consider it like a copy of Neil Strauss's game if it had a baby with Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. Uh, there's <laughs> rhinestone.com where you'll find my original blog and... Uh, some of that stuff. I have a sub stack now. So every week I'm giving you guys updates on the new book. Like one of the strategies I have for writing the book is I don't like to surprise people. So you sign up for the sub stack, you know, paid or not. And you'll actually get excerpts of, as I write the book, where the sources that I use for my material come from. And it's almost like you're in the room writing it with me. And you learn about all the stuff to see the finished state. I equate it to when you go to see a comedian, and then a month, six months later, you go to see the Netflix, you watch the Netflix special and you see how the thing has changed. And you're like, oh, I remember that joke. Oh, so it's really interesting and it's good. It brings people along for the process. It shows the work that goes into it. It's not just some guy running his mouth. And then as always, there's YouTube. You just look for Ryan Stone on YouTube. It's not hard to find me. Um, if you're on there and you don't know where to start, just go to the sidebar series. 
it's all of the fundamental texts and ideas within the red pill in a teaching format. I used to be a teacher back at fleet school on the West coast when I was in the military. So it's mostly geared to be a supplement to the reading material. And it's all listed in there to get you up to speed on everything you wanted to know about frame, about dread and divorce, about men and women, about mental health that we've all come up with like thousands of us over like a decade and the stuff that's worked for us. So you can pick and choose the parts of it that you think apply to you or that can help you. Um, a lot of great authors in there, like Athel K, Robert Glover, uh, David Clare, very smart, much men that are smarter than me that have been around for as long as the Manosphere has been around. No Bugattis, no White Claw Power Hour. It's just information. So, and that's it there. And then once you're past all that, and you just want to be entertained. I got a gaming channel, Digital Ryan. And that's just for afterwards, like Dev, who just gave you the super chat. He's in there. It's just where guys can get together. And it's like, I would just like to talk red pill stuff with people because I can't talk about it at work. I can't talk about it at home, but at least I can come here and we can just chit chat about this stuff quietly and enjoy myself without any of the drama attached to it. So that's it there. Well, it's good to have those kinds of conversations because I find they are fewer and far between in oh. this space, right? They're mostly like Chris. Williams you are the master of understatement, film. sir. <laughs> yeah. so, I think it's, there are some people out there, like as Nixon would say, a silent maybe not a silent majority, but there's people out there who like this kind of conversation and who are dying for it. They just don't yeah. get it. They just don't, because no one's providing it because there's no, there's not much incentive for the people to provide it. Unfortunately, yeah. it doesn't sell, but, um, it doesn't sell, it doesn't sell merch. Right. And so you have a book coming up on dread too, as just to leave a little cliffhanger here. Yeah. Well, that's the whole point of frame. The original book was supposed to be on dread. Dread was, um, the process of a guy who's in a dead bedroom to reclaim his self-respect and stop being taken for granted, basically to rekindle a sex life from a dead bedroom, not necessarily the way you wanted, but it's a way you'll be happy at the end. The book got huge. It started to become the size of two books. And so I realized like the scope is too big. And so I had to split it up. The first one is frame and that's about developing your own mental point of origin. And now the second half of it is going to be on dread. So well, I really it's definitely like meant to be a companion series. What's that? The definition of dread is the opposite of being taken for granted. And I think yeah. that's a very yeah. good definition. It's a good one. Jack Tenna Hart's another guy who's smarter than me, been around a longer, came up with that one. So you'll see. My Substack, my latest post that just came on, and it talks about why it's called dread and what's involved with it. So it'll be pretty, it's a good, interesting read anyway. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. But I anything so. else you want to say here before we wrap up? No, just thank you. Thank you for being normal and good. You know what? And I, I don't mean to sound this as like flippant or like mocking or anything. It's just really, everybody's a clown and insane. And just to talk to a normal human being, it's fucking nice. <laughs> Thank you. No, I appreciate it. And I appreciate <laughs> Thank you for being switched you on. Favorite. Thank you for having a good relationship. Thank you for not, not uh, growing a cuck beard. Like, you know what I mean? Like all the goofiness. Thank you for not having any of it. And sure. thank your audience because they've actually been pretty chill seeing them in the comments yeah, right now. They don't go too wild on me. People, um, <laughs> There's overlap, but I'm clearly not completely in your world. I kind of had my foot in a couple different worlds. <laughs> That's a compliment. <laughs> my place yeah, is a so <laughs> It is what it is, and I'm kind of yeah. glad I didn't dive into it years ago when I first discovered it. But, yeah, you know, I think it's working out for the best now. Yeah, but it's either good. Thank you very much. And hopefully, like I said, I hope, I know Dev, he's from a guy I've known for a while now. I hope more guys find you as well, because, like, there's a huge audience out there that's tired of BS and just wants normal people with useful things. So I really hope like you do way better than me in the next six months. That'd be awesome. Cause I ain't shit. I wish you <laughs> all the continued success in the world too, my man. You as well. All right. All right here. All righty. That's the end.